Hi, everybody. I'm Marikita Solis or Marikita Solis from We Did It Health, and I'm excited today because we're about to learn a, a very big amount of stuff, <laughs> a great deal of lessons. Food engineer Camilla Paracello. Um, and so much, so much information that I can't even wrap my head around it or speak because I'm so excited <laughs> about this. So this is a very big learning experience for, for us all as we learn and talk about how food is produced. Because many times as consumers, we buy food, but we just kind of have to, well, we have to hope and trust that it's safe. But today we're going to get the real scoop on food safety, food production, and what, what we need to be aware of. So we are here with um, Camilla Paracello, and she's <laughs> giving us her insight on, on food production. And thank you, Lori and Fernando, for coming. And I welcome everyone who's watching, um, because we're about to find out the truth here. So thank you, Camilla. <laughs> thank you, Mary Kita. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our episode number three. Let me share my slide. I think I'm not able to screen oh. share. Let me see here. Okay. Okay, let me try again. Okay, perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so again, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Camila Perucello. I am a food engineer, scientist, and author. And just to recap, before we start today's talk, episode one was an introduction where I told you a little bit about myself and my career journey. We also discussed what food engineering really is. In episode two, we made a case for the whole food plant-based diet, discussing why plant-based eating is a key component of a healthy, non-violent and sustainable lifestyle. I also gave you precious tips on how to make the most of your food choices and how to transition to a whole food plant-based diet. We also discussed different health and nutrition topics, which are very helpful, whether you already eat. So if you're interested, please watch the previous episodes on We Did It Health's um, YouTube channel. And if you enjoy our talks, please make sure you like the video so the good message reaches more people. So today in episode three, we will talk about processed foods and how they impact our health. Now, we all know that food connects to absolutely everything. The way we produce and consume food impacts both global and local economies. It affects animals either directly through the consumption of animal products or indirectly through deforestation, the destruction of habitats for um, agricultural purposes or due to pollution. And because our eating habits impact the environment and human health, they also affect our society um, as a whole, including political decisions and again, the economy. So that shows how powerful our food choices are. So it is crucial that people know how their food is produced and what is the implication of their food choices. And this is my mission. It is, uh, my mission is to educate people based on scientific evidence and knowledge is power. We can change our lives and the lives of others when we know better. So this is my gift for you. No. Okay, so eating habits have constantly evolved throughout the centuries. For example, before the invention of agriculture, uh, we obtained food through hunting, yeah. gathering, um, and only enough to meet our survival needs. Then around 11,000 years ago, humans started to domesticate plants and other animals, uh, but still the diversity was limited. 
the main plant families were grasses, like, for example, rice, corn, and wheat, and legumes like lentils, peas, and some kinds of beans. And animal domestication focused on small, resilient, and docile animals that were easier to raise and slaughter, like goats and sheep. And then over time, more and more plant and animal species were incorporated into the food chain as agricultural practices evolved. So the advancement of farming methods, including breeding and genetic manipulation of animals and plants, as well as food technology, have completely changed how we consume food. In most geographical regions, you go to the grocery store and choose whatever you want, both healthy and unhealthy options. But the major transformation in our food systems and our food habits took place over the last century. For thousands of years, humanity relied primarily on cereals, legumes and tubers as staples. Even in the mid 1900s, meat, dairy and fish were luxury items. It was really over the past decades that an explosion happened in terms of food availability and convenience, resulting in the overconsumption of animal products and ultra processed foods that we see nowadays. So even though in developing countries, plant foods are still the main staples, frequently for economic reasons, um, animal products and heavily processed foods make up a huge share of the average diet in wealthier nations. Now, the modern food chain is way more complex and reliant on technology than it was in the past, which is neither good nor bad in itself. As with everything, science and technology can improve or worsen the world. As I always say, science operates at the level of our awareness and integrity. So it really depends on us to guide technology and knowledge in the right direction. So while we have improved people's access to diverse and healthy food in many countries, we have also caused the consumption of junk food and animal products to rise abruptly with severe and severe health and environmental consequences. So in episode two, we discussed um, important reasons why we need to change our food system towards plant-centered diets if we are serious about feeding a growing population in a world with finite resources. Now, there is obviously a lot we need to change regarding food production and eating habits to support a healthy planet with healthy people. However, there is way too much hearsay and misinformation out there about food. And a major one pertains to food processing. Many people with no background at all in engineering and technology love to use the term processed foods as something inherently bad. This is factually incorrect. First of all, any food that is not in their natural state is considered processed. However, processed foods like donuts, chicken nuggets and ready to eat noodles are absolutely not comparable to other processed foods like olives, almond flour and dried fruit, which are obviously healthy options. So here is an important take home message. Processed foods can be both healthy and unhealthy because not all processed foods are the same. So like I said, by definition, if a food was altered in any way, it has been processed. So most foods and beverages are processed before purchase or consumption. We even process food at home. Roasting, frying, fermentation, and steaming are all forms of processing. 
And there are as many processing methods as there are types of food. So I will not give you a comprehensive list of food processing methods because the list will be way too long and technical. But what you need to know is that the use of industrial large scale equipment in food manufacturing does not necessarily make a product more processed than something prepared at home. Think of roasting peanuts, for example, or drying tomatoes in the sun. What does, um, in this case, you're basically using the same processes employed in the food industry, only on a different scale. What does make a difference is that companies obviously need to comply with market requirements and legislation standards, meaning they might use additional processing steps and additives to meet quality standards and shelf life ex expectations. But these additional stages will depend on a lot of factors, including the company size, customers, and, and um, internal manufacturing methods. So the bottom line here is we have always processed food, and this doesn't need to be a bad thing quite the opposite. So we must understand that the level of processing, the processing method, and the purpose of processing all make a difference in terms of the impact of processed food on human health. But most importantly, the health impact also depends on the type of raw ingredients. Despite common belief, not everything that is natural or unprocessed is healthy or even edible. I'll give you three examples. Cashew nuts. We all know that cashew nuts are healthy. Um, they are a source of essential fatty acids, for example. However, Unprocessed cashews cannot be eaten because they contain a toxin, a toxin called urushiol. The second example is cow's milk. In 2022, many people believe that cow's milk is healthy or processed or both, or unprocessed or both. But the truth is cow's milk must be thermally treated to kill pathogens. Otherwise, it becomes a serious safety issue. So dairy milk, raw dairy milk is absolutely unsafe for consumption. And the third example is red meat. Many people claim that animal flesh is healthy because it is unprocessed. But there are several misconceptions in this single statement. If we make conclusions based on facts, we'll see that animals undergo a huge deal of processing before they are slaughtered. Not to mention that red meat consumption is associated with cancer. Okay, so let me give you more details about these three examples. Now, cashew nuts have a great balance of nutrients, including like I said, essential fatty acids, but also proteins, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. And because of their content of omega-3 and omega-6, cashew nuts are great allies in maintaining our brain health. However, cashew nuts are not edible unless they are processed. And that's because the plant contains a toxin in the oil inside the nutshell that causes severe skin burns and blisters. So unprocessed cashews are dangerous to eat and even touch. So even when we buy cashews labeled as raw cashews, it doesn't mean they are in their natural state. They did undergo processing because after the cashew nuts are removed from the fruit and before they are even shelled, they are thermally treated to avoid the risk of toxin exposure, which means that cashews labeled as raw are actually either roasted or steamed at high temperatures. 
but they are free of added flavoring. So that's why they are called raw cashews. So cashews may be roasted a second time for flavoring purposes and be added with salt and spices. And in this case, they will be sold as roasted cashews. So this is a clear example of how food engineering and technology helps us make the most of nutritious resources. Another important point is that not everything that people often consider natural is unprocessed or even healthy, which leads me to my second example. So raw dairy milk is unsafe for human consumption because of the risk of microbial contamination. There are many microorganisms of concern in milk like Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria, Campylobacter, and so on. And contaminated milk can lead to serious diseases and even death. Just to give you an idea of the economic cost of zoonotic diseases linked to animal products, Campylobacteriosis alone costs the European Union 2.4 billion euros a year. And here I'm talking about a single microorganism and one single animal product. So after the animal is killed, is milked, sorry, we are talking about dairy cows here, thermal processing, usually pasteurization, is mandated by legislation. So natural or unprocessed foods do not equate to health. And unlike popular opinion, cow's milk is typically processed. Secondly, cow's milk is indeed a source of important nutrients like high quality proteins, calcium, and vitamin D, but, it's, but it also contains naturally occurring hormones, saturated fats, cholesterol, sugars, and growth factors. And that um, should not be surprising because milk from mammals is a breast secretion supposed to meet the nutritional needs of their babies. Females produce milk to make their babies grow strong and fast. So milk is also rich in a specific protein called casein and a sugar called lactose. And all the nutrients and substances I mentioned have a purpose in nature. However, they also have been shown to cause a wide range of health problems in humans, from minor conditions like acne to lactose intolerance, allergies, type two diabetes, and other diseases. On top of that, cow's milk is also prone to aflatoxin contamination from the feed. It can be a source of heavy metal exposure, and contain pesticide and drug residues. So my point in this example is many products that people think are natural are not necessarily unprocessed or healthy. And my third and last example is red meat. So despite the science denial on the side of both the animal industry and consumers alike, red meat is carcinogenic. There is no doubt about that. Not only is meat consumption associated with heart disease, obesity, stroke, and diabetes, but also cancer, especially bowel cancer. The World Health Organization and the International Agency for Research on Cancer placed processed meat, for example, bacon, sausages, and ham at the top of the list of carcinogenic substances in group one, along with tobacco, for example. The report showed that as little as two slices of bacon per day increased the risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. And I don't know about you, but I don't know any omnivore who eats smaller portions than that, let alone just one type of meat. And unprocessed red meat like beef and pork that was not submitted to processes like 
curing, fermentation, and smoking are listed as probably carcinogenic in group 2A. And these are conclusions based on 800 studies carried out across different countries and reviewed by a big panel of international and independent experts. And since this report was published in 2015, there are so many new studies supporting the same conclusions that it is difficult to keep up with them. And by the way, research also indicates a link between chicken meat consumption and cancer. For example, malignant melanoma, uh, prostate cancer, and a type of blood cancer called non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma. However, this, uh, the evidence in this direction in terms of number of studies is not as strong as for red meat, at, le at least not yet. But the central message in this example is not only the processing method and the degree of processing matter, but also the type of raw material. Red meat is carcinogenic, period. Now, many people ask me about the underlying mechanisms of meat consumption and cancer development. So I decided to add this slide to our talk today. Now, studies indicate different reasons why meat is linked to an increased risk of cancer. One of them is quite simple and is associated with our gut microbiome or the microorganisms living in our digestive system. For example, the gut microbiota in vegans and vegetarians is abundant in beneficial bacteria that provide anti-inflammatory properties, for example, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. On the other hand, the gut microbiota of omnivores typically contains harmful microorganisms, such as Clostridium bacteroides and Bilophila, which are involved in inflammation, infections, and even antibiotic resistance. On top of that, beneficial microorganisms are also reduced in the gut of omnivores. Another reason for the link between meat and cancer is chronic inflammation. For example, research shows that meat consumption increases our levels of C-reactive protein, which is an indicator of inflammation. And chronic inflammation happens to be an important trigger in cancer development. Now, the third reason is the carcinogenic compounds that form in meat when you cook it. For example, heterocyclic amines are carcinogens that form when animal muscle, no matter the type of animal, is exposed to high temperatures from around 100 to 300 degrees Celsius. These compounds are exclusive to animal flesh. This is important to mention because you need creatine to form this compound. So there is no problem in um, exposing vegetables to high temperatures. The problem is exclusive to animal flesh. Um, and a solid list of studies shows a link between high temperature cooked meat and different types of cancer. Breast, colon, lung, pancreas, prostate, and stomach cancer, for example. And other than um, heterocyclic amines, other carcinogenic substances like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and and nitroso compounds also form during the cooking, curing, and smoking of meat. So if you care about your health, um, definitely avoid meat because there are way too many risks. Now, going back to our main argument here, which is food processing. Food processing has gotten quite a bad reputation and unfairly. There are many good reasons to process food. 
And the first and probably the most obvious is to make raw material edible and increase food diversity. We saw the case of cashew nuts. Another example are olives. Olives are not edible unless they are fermented. Also, you can make completely different products from the same raw material, depending on the type of processing, cooking, fermentation, drying, and so forth. Think of all the ingredients and end products you can obtain from a single plant or part of a plant, for example, wheat. Another reason to process food is to increase safety uh, to prevent consumers from getting ill from eating a certain product. We saw some examples before, like milk and cashew nuts. We also process food for our convenience to enable easier preparation. Can you imagine, for example, milling your own grains so you can have pasta for dinner? Um, another important reason is food access. Processed foods can reach certain populations and geographical regions where these products are generally not available. Dried foods, fermented foods, and canned foods, for example, are easier to distribute and store. You can also make these products available during the winter in countries with big seasonal changes, for example. We can also reduce food waste by extending the durability or shelf life of a food product. So the application of proper processing methods, the right combination of ingredients and sometimes additives and the right package can extend the shelf life of a product from days to months without necessarily affecting the nutritional value. Think of dried fruit, for example. Through processing, we can also add value to agri-food waste and byproducts. And one example is okara, the leftover from the manufacturing of soy milk we talked about in episode one. So after you extract the milk from the soybeans, the residue from the process is a wet mass containing around 90% of the solids from the soybeans. This means that okara is very rich in high quality proteins, good fats, fibers, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. But despite the nutritional value, okara spoils very fast. So from the supply um, chain, from the supply chain and the logistics point of view, it might be tricky to use okara in the fresh form to enrich, for example, a bakery product. But if you dry this material using the right technology, you can make different protein-rich ingredients. For example, flour or textured vegetable protein to be used as plant-based mints or plant-based meatballs. Another example is apple pomace, which is generated in the manufacturing of jam, juice, cider, and other products made from apples. Apple pomace contains the pulp, seeds, stems, and skin of the fruit, and it is an excellent source of interesting nutrients and other compounds of industrial application. You can use these leftovers not only as food ingredients and additives, but also in other sectors, for example, in beauty products and in the packaging industry. Food processing can also be used to improve food quality. For example, we can optimize the sensory properties of a product so it meets certain standards. For example, the consistency of a nut butter or the melting properties of plant-based cheese. There are many ways of doing this, but we basically improve the taste, smell, appearance, texture, and mouthfeel, and also other properties of a food product using the right ingredients and the right processing methods. We can also improve the nutritional profile of a food product by adding important nutrients 
or by increasing the bioavailability of a naturally occurring nutrient through processing. For example, sprouting and fermentation of legumes in general. And finally, another reason to use food processing is to produce sustainable and healthy alternatives to products that are either resource intensive, unhealthy, or both. Think of natural sweeteners, for example, to replace refined sugar or plant-based products that look and taste like their animal-based counterparts, but without harming animals, your health and the planet. So many, so there are many good reasons why we process food. But like I said in the beginning, we can use technology either for the greater good or with not so good intentions. I will give you some examples, although I must be clear that serious companies would ideally not do these things. And most of us realize that our food systems are far from ideal. They are definitely not designed to feed people in a healthy, ethical and eco-friendly way. But I want to stress that customers do have a big role in this. Customer is, customer is king and industries produce what people want to buy. So if we keep consuming in a mindless way without real concern for our health, the suffering of other creatures and the health of our planet, things are not going to change. But going back to my main argument, food companies sometimes use technology to increase, for example, the sensory appeal of products with poor nutritional value. Think of ultra processed foods designed ultimately to hook the consumer. Also, food processing is sometimes used to mask defects in the raw ingredients, which applies to many cases. When an ingredient is not fresh enough to be eaten raw or in a minimally, proce or in a minimally processed form, when the microbial counts are high and you need some kind of processing to increase safety, or when you want to mask a defect that would put off consumers. This last example is very common in second graded meat. And here I must mention something important. We all know that females, female animals used for eggs and milk are discarded when their productivity declines, regardless of the production system. And usually they are killed for lower graded meat. Egg laying hands, for example, are killed after 12 to 18 months because they are exhausted and cannot lay the expected number of eggs anymore. And because of their living conditions and this exhaustive and manipulated egg laying cycle, hands are frequently prone to different injuries. For example, bone fractures are very common in the egg industry. And the hands are also prone to fighting to, due to stress and so on. So a way to mask, let's say, bruises in their flesh is by processing their meat into soups, nuggets, sausages, and so on. So the bottom line here is, in any sector, technology can be used for good or bad purposes. Let's change to another topic now. So look at these pictures. Um, sweet corn, cornstarch, homemade corn tortillas, flavored snacks, and high glucose corn syrup all come from the same raw material. And although all these products have been processed, they obviously don't have the same nutritional value and the same health impact. So processing is not the villain, but sometimes it can be. And now I want to touch on ultra processed foods. Now, these are a global threat to public health. Ultra processed foods typically undergo harsh processing. They are made with low cost ingredients and contain additives to enhance their sensory appeal and stability. 
These products are frequently calorie dense. They have a long shelf life and are high in refined sugars, saturated fats, trans fats, and sodium. And I must highlight that of course, legislation controls what and how much can be added to a food product. However, some ingredients, including um, naturally occurring substances, do cause addiction. For example, fats, sugars, and milk do have addictive properties, especially when used in combination. And also to make ultra processed foods last longer and be more appealing to consumers, they usually contain different additives like flavorings, colors, and preservatives. So for all these reasons, ultra processed foods are linked to adverse health effects. These effects include uh, obesity, type two diabetes, depression, allergies, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. Just for perspective, ultra processed foods account for 50 to 60% of the calorie intake in the US, Canada, and the UK, and roughly 20 to 40% of calories in other high income and middle income countries. Now, let's understand a bit more about the differences in processing level using a classification system called NOVA. So in group one, we have unprocessed or minimally processed foods. So in this case, processing aims to increase food stability and enable easier or more diverse preparation. Examples of unprocessed or minimally processed foods are fresh fruits, frozen vegetables, pulses, patched grains, flowers, nuts, plain pasta, and chilled meat. Then in group two, we have processed ingredients. Processing here aims to create products to be used in preparation, seasoning, and cooking of group one foods. Examples are butter, sugar, vegetable oils, molasses, honey, and salt. In group three, we have processed foods, where processing aims to increase the stability and durability of group one foods and to make them more enjoyable. Examples are canned vegetables in brine, batched breads, cheeses, and cured meats. And finally, in group four, we have ultra-processed foods. Examples are snacks, cookies, instant soups, ready-to-eat meals, candy, and soft drinks. So that is why it's factually incorrect to say processing is bad because it really depends on the type of level of processing and like I said before the type of raw ingredients too. Now bringing all these concepts together it's easy to understand that the typical western diet is far from ideal. Too much sugar, salt, alcohol and a massive amount of animal products and ultra processed food. The average person in the US, Europe, Argentina, and Brazil consumes twice the protein needed, mostly animal protein, but insufficient amounts of fibers, antioxidants, and other important nutrients like vitamins and minerals. And it might sound shocking, but around 75% of people in North America don't meet the minimum daily intake of fruit and vegetables. Another critical point regards the massive amount of highly processed foods in the average omnivore diet. Sliced white bread, cheese, ham, chicken nuggets, refined sugar, bacon, sausages, etc., are all highly processed and make, a, and make up a significant share of the average person's diet. And even when omnivores claim to follow a more unprocessed diet, this is factually inaccurate for many reasons. Um, the first reason is you can eat a carrot right from the soil or an apple from the tree, 
but the same doesn't apply to the vast majority of animal products. The animal must be killed, bled, gutted, deboned, skinned, defeathered, butchered, and refrigerated before um, their body parts reach the consumer. So what is considered fresh meat is not that fresh and unprocessed. The second reason is most animal products cannot be eaten raw. They are either treated in the food industry or at home. For example, milk and eggs are pasteurized for food safety reasons. Sausage, ham, and bacon undergo a series of processing stages, for example, cooking, curing, and smoking. And also the consumer uses frying, grilling, roasting, and other cooking methods before eating meat. Um, also, raw, unflavored, and um, untreated animal products are not only unsafe for consumption, but are often bland from the sensory point of view. That's why most people use um, most people use spices, herbs, and salt before eating meat and other animal products. Cheese, for example, is also full of salt. And another point is that people often forget about the on-farm stage of animal sourced food production. Farmed animals are selectively bred. They are genetically manipulated to grow faster and produce muscle and secretions with specific characteristics. They are pumped with antibiotics and, and growth promoters. They are supplemented with different nutrients. They are fed genetically modified feed and so forth. So it is inaccurate to say animal products are natural. So all these examples show that people believe and say many things that are not based on facts and evidence. And this is a threat to their own health. So, but thankfully science is there to help us overcome misinformation. So an ideal diet from both the health and environmental point of view is a whole food plant-based diet. For those who are unfamiliar with this term, a whole food plant-based diet is a diet free from animal products based primarily on fresh fruits, veggies, whole cereals, beans, peas, lentils, mushrooms, seaweed, nuts, and other unprocessed or minimally processed foods. And despite what some people believe, eating plant-based doesn't need to include ultra-processed foods replicating Western eating habits. I mean, you can eat this way, and moderation is always important, but there are better options, definitely. Now, eating a varied whole food plant-based diet is the cheapest and most efficient way of eating healthy and minimizing heavily processed foods. A plant-based diet can be healthy and nutritionally adequate for all stages of life and for athletes too. Um, and the key to a healthy and balanced plant-based diet is variety. Many public health agencies and as well as the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the world's largest, which is the world's largest organization of food and nutritional professionals, issued statements in support of vegetarian and vegan diets. So plant-based diets can prevent common health problems like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and certain types of cancer and even revert some diseases. For those who want to learn more about the why and how of plant-based eating, please have a look at these two books. Food for Thought is my latest work. It is an evidence-based book that resulted from years of research and professional experience in food production. It explains why and how you as an individual and consumer can create a better world for everyone through your food choices. And it's important to say that Food for Thought is not a book about diet. It's about justice. It's about living mindfully. It's about respecting the rights of other living beings and how this approach um, 
solves the most pressing issues facing humanity, but it does talk a lot, a lot about diet and practical tips on eating and living uh, plant-based. And then when it comes specifically to health and nutrition, I also recommend a book called Eating Plant-Based Scientific Answers to Your Nutrition Questions. This book was written by two medical doctors. They answer common questions about diet and health using clear, plain language. And it's a very good book. So please have a look at these two books. I think you'll like them. Um, so to really hammer the idea home, processed foods are not all the same. We have to stop portraying food processing as a bad thing because this is absolutely false. The health impact of food depends on many factors, like I said before, including the type of food, the level of processing, the processing method, and the reason for processing. But ultra-processed foods should be absolutely avoided. They are not healthy, so be aware. And last but not least, growing evidence shows that a whole food plant-based diet is the best way to eat healthy and unprocessed. I hope this was insightful and thank you all for listening. <laughs> and I am available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Yes, we do have questions, I'm sure. Let me read the comments that we have. Um, let's see, if you wanna stop your share, whenever you're ready. Oh okay. yeah, stop share. <laughs> so right. thank you, that was wonderful. Um, thank Fernando, you. Fernando's saying very informative presentation, well done. It's useful to have arguments on processed foods beyond the simple, discussion on the number of ingredients. Amen to that. And he has a question, what exactly constitutes and defines whole foods? Okay, so whole foods are foods that are in their natural state or are minimally processed. So for example, fruits, vegetables, um, whole grains are whole foods. And here it's important to, yeah, maybe explain what a whole grain or whole cereal is because I see sometimes there is a bit of conf confusion around that. So if you think about, for example, a rice kernel, uh, a rice grain, um, when we talk about, for example, white rice, the outer part of the grain has been removed for many reasons because for to to cook faster, for example, to enable easier preparation at home, because people <clears throat> don't want to, because they want to cook uh, rice faster, for example. So uh, we all know that brown rice takes much longer to cook than white rice. So the outer layer of the grain is composed of fiber, uh, minerals, vitamins, and a lot of nutrients. So when you remove this part of the grain, you will remove a substantial fraction of the nutrients of the grain. So you are losing nutritional value when you refined grains and cereals. So, um, so brown rice, for example, would be a whole food while uh, refined or white um, rice would not be considered a whole food. So was that the question? Yes. Yeah, okay. That's I hope this answer. answers. There's another question. Is brown sugar considered refined sugar and is it healthier than white sugar? Yes, brown sugar is considered refined sugar, definitely. And from the nutritional point of view, brown sugar and white sugar are nearly identical. Um, white sugar is, we all know, it's made from either sugar cane or sugar beets. Um, the plants undergo a lot of processing stages involving high temperatures and a lot of chemicals. So that's why white sugar is considered um, 
heavily processed. And then the difference between brown sugar and white sugar in terms of processing is that white sugar is 100% sucrose, while brown sugar is 95% sucrose and 5% of molasses. And molasses is a leftover from the sugar cane processing. So they are all, they are nearly identical from the point of view of nutrition. They, uh, both of them cause spikes, um, blood, um, sugar spikes in, in our blood. So they're both unhealthy. But yeah, if you need to pick between the two, yeah, I would say go for brown sugar, but there are definitely um, healthier options. Well, that's good to know. And Linda's asking, is extracted jackfruit still good for us? Extracted jackfruit. Sorry, I don't know what this is. Well, I can't can explain, explain ahead, please, Linda. Linda. <laughs> can you unmute yourself, Linda? Well, I, I know that they use jackfruit for to make barbecue, but yeah, <laughs> it's know. a meat, it's a common meat substitute. Okay, I have yeah, a, I have yeah. a question. Did I unmute myself yet? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, I I um <clears throat> I buy these keto. I mean, sorry, I buy these. They call them keto, which I don't care about, but they call <laughs> them directed, um jackfruit is the sweetener in my chocolate chips it's called chalk zero right okay i don't know i would have to research it i'm even googling it right now so oh, I don't okay know. so it's an ingredient in your chalk chips i wonder what the function the technological function of extracted jackfruit would be yeah. i really don't but it can it's kind of like look um, it up and answer. Is it later. like maple syrup? You know, like maple syrup is extracted. <laughs> yeah, but why jackfruit? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know the answer. That's to okay. That. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have Great some presentation, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. I I'm okay. Jackfruit seeds contain four. Okay, a lot of non-reducing sugars, a potential prebiotic ingredient. Okay, so I just learned something new now. <laughs> so yeah, it's used as, let's say a healthier type of sugar. It's used to sweeten. But is it is, it's healthier than sugar, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because if it's a prebiotic, it means you're feeding the probiotics in your gut and probiotics are, the beneficial bacteria living in yeah. our digestive system. So if it's considered a prebiotic, it means it is uh, rich in fibers, for example. Fibers or- like, like maple syrup? Sorry? Like maple syrup, is that the same? Yes, yeah, it would be something like, maple syrup is not a prebiotic, as far as I know. Okay. It's mainly composed of uh, sucrose. Okay. But if it says here, this is a prebiotic ingredient, it means uh, it's made of a healthy kind of carbohydrate. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know, oligofructosaccharides can be one. It's a, a hypothesis, I, I'm not sure. But yeah. it's definitely... Um, healthier than sugar. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I can eat my chocolate chips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> um, well, here's a comment from Fernando. I presume extracted jackfruit and maple syrup are better than sugar anyway. What about stevia and other sweeteners? Yeah, what, what about the other sweeteners? I have some, some date syrup, but that's... Yeah, yeah they are better. It? What do you they recommend? Are better. Definitely, yes. Yeah, so what stevia that? is um, a leaf and you can extract sugars from it. So yeah, it's definitely um, healthier than, than white sugar, than refined sugar, definitely. And stevia? 
Yes, same thing. Yeah, I was talking about stevia. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Stevia is a leaf, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, we have artificial sweeteners like aspartame. I don't even know how to pronounce it in, in English. But yeah, this will be um, synthetically produced um, sugar, a uh, sweetener, which, yeah, like it's artificial, so it's better to avoid it. Right. And, Lord, and the good thing is, like, eating sugar is a habit. We don't, once you start to reduce the amount of sugar you add to your recipes, for example, you, I don't know, you eventually you start to dislike the taste of sugar. For example, um, let's talk about chocolate, for example. I can't stand the taste of sugar with less than 80% cocoa, for example. It's too sweet. It's way too sweet for me. I just can't. Like for me, the ideal percentage would be 90% or even 95. Yeah. So it's a matter of habit. But of course, if you're talking about a processed um, cookie, like the chocolate chips that Linda mentioned, uh, yeah, y you, can, you, you cannot really control what they had to these products. But so that's why I always say that the easiest and healthiest way of eating desserts is making them from scratch. Because then you uh, can be absolutely sure of what you were adding to your products. Well, does anybody else have any more questions? It looks like we're coming up to the end of the hour, but this has been very amazing. Look at Linda saying, I make my chocolate chips with oatmeal and banana. Yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Laurie says, read labels to make sure no added ingredients. Yeah, and there's one more question. Can you give us any advice on what and how to read labels critically? Yeah, actually, this is a topic for the next two episodes because episode, yeah, maybe I could show you the overview of our next presentations. I don't know if I can share my screen again. We only have three minutes, but we will be talking about food additives in episode number four and about food labeling in episode number five. So I will bring like real life examples of labels and how to read, how to interpret each of the ingredients and additives. So I think you will like it. <laughs> Yes, I'm looking forward to it too. And Fernando, thank you for joining. And everyone, thank you for joining. This has been very informative. I've got a lot to think about. I mean, I'm glad you went over the thing about the rice because I didn't oh, yeah. understand the difference. Yeah, there's a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of things I don't know about. So that every week is, uh, it's fascinating. I hope the presentation was not overwhelming because I know there's a lot of information. <laughs> No, it's wonderful. And so if you're watching on YouTube, please um, subscribe and share this with people. We, people need to know what's in yeah. their food, this, pr this process. We need to take um, responsibility for our health, not oh, leave yeah. it to anyone else. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So Laurie asked, when is the next episode? And it will be in two weeks. So let me check here. It will be on the 11th of January. Right. At the same time, same place. We'll all be here again, I hope. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone.